today as we come to the table. Let me tell you something. God knows your family. He knows your mom. He knows your dad. He knows you. He knows where you live. When it's God, that's a good thing. You don't have to be creeped out about that. You can't hide from God. You can't hide from Him. It wasn't like, I got away with that. God doesn't know. God knows. And for His kids, He knows exactly what we're doing. I used to get away with stuff before Christ. I didn't get away with everything. But I got away with some stuff. Now, I can't get away with anything. Are you creeped out or comforted by the fact that God knows everything about you? Sometimes it seems like it could go either way, but be comforted. God knows all your sins, mistakes, and imperfections, but He loves you anyway. The Bible says that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's reassuring. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. In his message today, Pastor Mark will encourage you by teaching that God knows everything about you and loves you. He could have rejected you, but he loves you in the midst of your sin. It's tempting to try to hide from God as you feel ashamed of your sin. You can't hide though, so don't try. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Joshua chapter six with today's edition of Come to the Table. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. Remember, she's the one that protected the spies. She and all who are with her in her house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And notice this command he gives her. This is going to come back to haunt them here shortly. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Here is a warning for us. Listen, guys, God wants us to keep our hands off the accursed things of the world. Now, we know what they are, and the Lord will show you what they are. Whatever that thing is in your life you're being tempted toward that you know is an accursed thing, I should have no part in this, and you know you shouldn't have part in it. Maybe you're having part in it now. Well, you need to stop. God says, if you do this, if you have a part of that accursed thing, what happens? You become accursed. It affects your life. It hinders your walk with God. Even as a believer, you grieve the Spirit of God. And it's interesting here. We're going to see that as long as they had the accursed thing, they couldn't move forward in the things of the Lord. He says, you need to abstain from the accursed things, and that is their false gods, their things that they weren't to be a part of, but there's more to it. He says, but all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. Listen to what he's saying. This is the first city you're conquering when you're going in the land. You tithe this to me. You give me the first. You tithe it. This is my city. My gold, my bronze, my iron, God is saying, not because I need it, but you need to learn the principle of tithing. You need to learn to give the first to God. I'm giving you the entire land. Don't worry, you're going to be rewarded greatly. I'm going to make you a great and very wealthy nation. But I want you to learn something right off the bat. If you're going to walk in the promised land, God gets the first. Listen to me, believer. If you're saved and living the wilderness life and you want to walk in the promised land, you've got to learn the principles of walking in the promised land. And one of the principles of walking the promised land, God gets the first. I'm just going to say it. We as believers need to be giving God the first. Why? Because God says, I'm teaching you something. You need to walk by faith. You need to trust me that if you'll give me the first, I will bless you beyond. I'll open up the windows of heaven, so to speak. And so this is the principle that he was teaching them nationally. But there's a personal application here. And I'm telling you, those who walk in the fullness of the Spirit, you've got to obey in everything. If you want to walk in the fullness of the Spirit, it's not just an area here and an area there. If you say, I want to walk in the promised land of God, and I'm going to go in the fullness God has for me, then you've got to find every command God has given you, and you need to obey it. It's not a matter of works. It's a matter of obedience and love to the Lord. 
And so this is a huge lesson for the children of Israel and a huge lesson for us. God says, this is mine. This city doesn't belong to you. The money, none of it, it's mine. You're tithing this to me. It's consecrated to the Lord. They shall come, all of it shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And again, this would help them to build up their temple and their tabernacle and to basically run the functioning, you would say, of the church if you want a modern day application. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpet, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Those who tried to discredit the Bible used to say, now if the walls collapsed, you couldn't just run straight into the city because you'd have these big piles of rubble. And so right here proves the Bible is not even, they're just writing this and they're making it up. You know what's interesting? When they did the excavations of Jericho, guess what they found? The walls not only fell flat, intact, they went in. They uncovered Jericho and the walls had collapsed into the city flat, which means all they had to do was run straight forward, as God says right here, run right into the city and begin to conquer their enemies. Don't ever doubt God's word. Again, anytime somebody does, the archaeologist spade always proves them a liar. And God says, let every man be a liar and you know, God be true. But again, this is exactly what we now know archaeologically happened. And again, it's all been kind of dissolved and broken up over thousands of years. You can't see it probably as clearly now. And those of you that are going to Israel, you get to see Jericho this time. We're actually going to get to go to Jericho and see the city, and you'll see the ruins and all that. But anyway, they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who spied out the country, go into the harlot's house from there and bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. Now, what, how awesome this would have been. Because again, remember where she lived? On the wall, that's right. Why is that so important? When everything fell down, that would mean the walls all collapsed. There was one standing. God left one wall standing. That was Rahab's house. Guys, when destruction falls around us, if we're obedient to the Lord, God will make it to where we can stand. God will put a wall of protection around us. And God put a wall of protection around Rahab and around her family because they honored God even when no one else in the city did. I love it. How that must have looked. I doubt anyone stood around going, wow, look, their walls didn't fall. Ugh! You know, I doubt they did that. They probably didn't see it. But um, I kind of live these things out in my mind. I apologize for that. You know, <laughs> I'm sure they were running and screaming, so they probably didn't see the wall. Uh, but either way, so they destroyed them all. Uh, go in there, verse 23, and the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Even as God said, here's our tithe. The first city conquered. It belongs to you, Lord. Everything, the first goes to you, the first fruits. And Joshua spared Rahab, the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. Uh, so she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent out to spy on Jericho. So again, notice that at this time, she was still alive and living among them. And then Joshua, when this was written, that is, then Joshua charged them at that time saying, cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn and with his youngest, he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout all the country. God wanted to make a statement with this first conquered city in the land, so much so that he spoke prophetically through Joshua. And he said, you know what? If anybody tries to rebuild the ancient city, not that you couldn't rebuild that region. Jericho's been there throughout history. But he said, if anybody tries to rebuild this ancient city, their firstborn and their lastborn will die. Wow. Guess what? So far in history, one man tried it. First Kings chapter 16, a man by the name of Hiel. And guess what happened? His firstborn died and his lastborn died. God means what he says, and he says what he means. Why would God be so strict about this? Because God is making a point. I want the world to recognize I brought down the walls of Jericho because I was giving the land to the children of Israel, and I don't want the world to ever forget it. Nobody's going to rebuild it, and if you rebuild it, I'll kill your kids. Wow. Heavy duty. I, I'm not going to be trying to rebuild the walls of ancient Jericho. I can tell you that. Um, and I'm sure my girls want to make sure... They wouldn't let me do that either. Um, but the bottom line is, is God's true to his word. And this really happened. We know now historically this really happened. Chapter 7, but the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. Notice this, for Achan, by the way, his name means trouble. It's interesting, back here in, in verse 18, he says, don't take the accursed thing unless you trouble Israel. So this is a guy, that guy's name is trouble. He's trouble. His, his name really was trouble. 
Can you imagine? And I was thinking about that today. A lot of times, you know, names, you go, why do these names line up so well with certain people or whatever? God knows everybody in advance. And I think sometimes even certain names, you know, but Achan, uh, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zareth, the tribe of Judah took the accursed things and the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So what he said is, look, I said it all belongs to me. You're not to touch it. Here's, if Achan had just been patient, we're going to see that Achan ends up Achan because <laughs> they kill him with rocks and he dies and his kids go in on it with him. We're going to see that as well. So they get put to death as well. If they'd have only waited because the next victory at Ai and all the victories after that, God says, the spoil is yours. Take it. And they become a very wealthy people because all these nations are conquering. But the impatience for the pleasure now overwhelmed Achan and ended up destroying himself. Listen, there's a huge, again, warning in this for us. Satan will tell you, go for the pleasure now. Don't wait. Grab all you can get now. God will say, wait and do things the right way. Whatever that means in your life, wait and do things the right way. I will bless you richly if you'll just do it my way. But if you do it your own way, you may have temporary pleasure. I'm sure Achan was very excited when he had all these riches for a little while hidden under his tent. But when he gets called before everybody and put to death by, you know, stoning, I'm sure he had a much different attitude. And so it's an amazing lesson here. And it just patience, a lack of patience and greed and covetousness did him in. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Again, so nobody knows this at this point. So there's the scene. They've conquered him. He gets some stuff, hides it in his tent, and now they're going to the next battle. And watch this, overconfidence and a lack of prayer. I have been there, Joshua. My heart's with you, brother. Because he's going to show a lack of prayer and overconfidence, and they're going to have a major defeat. It doesn't matter how great the victory has been, we never stop praying. We never get overconfident. We never think that we did it. Boy, we handled Jericho. Look what he says. So Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth-Avon, and the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let the people go up, but let only about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Don't worry the people, for the people of Ai are a few. Look what we did to Jericho. I mean, we just swamped them. So we don't need to send all of our millions up there or even tens of thousands. Just send a few. It's a small place. Send a few up there and get overconfidence. And by the way, they're giving suggestions and nobody's saying, you know, maybe we should pray about this. Remember, we prayed a lot about Jericho and actually got a visitation from God. Remember, the commander of the Lord's army showed up. So why don't we just pray about this? Now, I'm, I'm not picking on Joshua. He's a young leader. You make lots of mistakes as, as a young leader. I've made many over the years. I make mistakes as an older leader. So my heart's with him, but at the same time, this is one, there's no such thing as a no-brainer. That's something God has taught me. We pray about everything. And so he didn't pray about this. And notice, so about 3,000 men went up from there, from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai struck down about 36 men. So killed about 36 of them, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Fear struck the hearts of the children of Israel because they went up now for this second battle, and they're defeated. They ran with their tail between their legs. 36 men get killed. By the way, these are the only men that we see, the only ones that die here in the book of Joshua in battle because they didn't pray. And again, what a warning here, lack of prayer and overconfidence, and they had casualties. So it's a warning to us to make sure we pray. But again, now they're, rather than realizing what's going on, and then Joshua tore his clothes, fell on the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, and the elders of Israel, so they're there with him, and they put dust on their heads. You know, in the Middle East, they would do that. They'd take dust and put it on their heads and you know, just well before God and make this big scene and tear their clothes or whatever. It was an expression. They're very expressionable people. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Now, what an insult to God. Joshua really is blowing it bad. He's accusing God of saying, God, you brought, would you bring us over here to die? It's like, Joshua, you're starting to sound like the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. I brought you into the promised land, and you know better than this. But even though we walk in the promised land and we begin to trust God and we begin to believe God, don't we sometimes find ourselves back in wilderness behavior? You ever been there? I have. Lord, I'm acting like wilderness behavior here. This is not good. I know better than this. You've been faithful up to this point. You're going to be faithful now. It's time for me to stop it. Stop it and trust God. I don't understand it. I don't like it, but enough. Time to zip the lips and trust the Lord, right? So Joshua here is messing up with his mouth. Again, I can associate all too well. Oh, that we'd been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. It would have been better if we hadn't come in the land. Ooh. You're telling God it would have been better not to follow him? You know, as a new believer, sometimes you start following the Lord and things get harder. 
You remember that? Those of you that have walked with the Lord any time, you start following the Lord and things get harder. You know why? Because you're in real battle. You're in real battle. Well, Satan and the demonic realm don't exist. Try opposing them for a while. Just try opposing them. You'll become a believer. Whether you become a believer in Jesus, you'll at least know the demonic realm is real. Because if you start doing things for God, you're going to get opposition. And so now they're getting the opposition. And rather than recognizing this as spiritual and physical opposition, and really spiritual here, even from God not being with them because of their, the sin that's in the camp, he's complaining. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? You know, what are we going to do now? They're not going to fear us. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it, and they'll surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And then what will we do for your great name? Lord, we're going to die. Everything's going to be destroyed. And then your name's going to be, what, Lord, you can't let this happen. It's like, time for a little bit of rebuke here. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. And I wonder how he said it. I bet it was firm. I mean, I've had the Lord, some of you have probably had that, where you know God spoke to you very firmly about something. I believe right here this was a pretty hard, you know, pretty, he's pretty accountable. He's the leader of God's people. He's watched Moses. He's in the land. He's grumbling. He's complaining. And I don't think it was, well, get up. Let's, let's chat. It was, get up. Get off your face. Stop grumbling against me. You should know better than this. And so a strong rebuke was needed here. I, I believe God gave him what it doesn't tell us how God said it. Although the guys that put the punctuations in there put an exclamation mark. I'm with them, but that's not really in the original. But either way, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Now he tells them what's happened. And he'd been praying. He'd known this. Israel has sinned. And they've also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things. Remember all the warnings about staying away from that? And they've both stolen and deceived. And they have also put them among their own stuff. Notice the words they, they, they. He's making plural. Why? Because we're going to see it wasn't just Achan. Achan's kids were in on this. His children were in on it. Apparently not his wife. We don't see her wiped out here. He says, therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but they turned their backs before their enemies because they had become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with them anymore unless, with you anymore, unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Here's a huge principle. You cannot walk in victory in the Lord if you have sin in your life knowingly. We all sin. I understand that. We're sinners. I get that. That's what I'm talking about. If you have chosen to sin, I'm going to do that sin. I'm not going to repent of it you will not get victory against AI or anything else. You're going to be stuck where you are, not walking in victory. And let me say this, you're not going to move forward. You'll stay there forever. You'll just live in the wilderness and be useless. Will you be saved? Yep. Will you go to heaven? Yep. But you'll be useless. You have no victory, no power, no advancing for the kingdom because you're choosing to hold on to the accursed thing. If you don't let go of the accursed thing, you're stuck right there. And the Lord will wait. He said, I'll wait as long as you will. He said, unless you get rid of the accursed thing, I'm not giving you victory in this area. And I'm not moving you on with me. You're not moving any farther in the land. But Lord, sorry. Because you need to walk in holiness. You've got to walk in purity. You've got to walk with me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you want to take the land, you're going to have to walk with me. And so um, you're not going to be able to move forward. Get up. Sanctify the people and say to them, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There's an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot, you cannot, notice that, not you will not, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come according to households, and the households which the Lord takes shall come accordingly, man by man. Now, imagine Achan at this point. Okay, certainly they're not going to find me out of over 2 million people. Let me tell you something. God knows your family. He knows your mom. He knows your dad. He knows you. He knows where you live. When it's God, that's a good thing. You don't have to be creeped out about that. But you can't hide from God. You can't hide from him. It wasn't like, I got away with that. God doesn't know. God knows. And for his kids, he knows exactly what we're doing. I used to get away with stuff before Christ. I didn't get away with everything. But I got away with some stuff. Now, I can't get away with anything. And it's not that I want to. It's just my flesh deceives me sometimes. And I'll kind of start leaning that way. And it's like, you know, God just steps in. I could share stories, but I won't. Here's the bottom line. If you're God's kid, he's going to call you on things. And he's going to chastise you. 
The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, and, and I think that applies pretty much to everybody, not just the believer. It's more so to the believer because we're more accountable. But you see all the things that are happening today. Look, all the people that are getting busted today for all the sexual stuff that we're watching happen in the news and all the whatever. This is the fruit of what we did in the 60s as a nation. The sexual revolution, man, be free, man. Everybody do what you want with sex and just go for it. Hey, man, be free. Now we have diseases and all the people that thought they were getting away with stuff, guess what's happening? You're not getting away with it. You got a break, but you're busted and you're exposed and it's affecting your careers, your lives, your families. What does the Bible say? God is not mocked. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Your sin will find you out. And here's the good news for the believer. If you're sitting out there right now going, oh, I've got some things and I don't want anybody to find out. You have an out. You have an out. Ask God to forgive you and repent. If you ask God to forgive you and repent, God says, done deal. Done deal. Lord, you won't tell anybody? Tell anybody what? It's forgiven. I don't see it. It's gone. But if you don't repent, what happens? At some point, Mark, everybody's going to know. So you make the call. You want it to be in front of the whole church or just your family or do you want nobody to find out? Then come to me and get right. Nobody will know because you stopped. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be some things we do as believers that God won't expose or that don't need to be exposed. Maybe there'll be people we need to go to to ask forgiveness. So I'm not trying to make it sound like some secret way we can get away with something. I'm not saying God approves of it. I'm saying once we're convicted and we ask forgiveness, God wipes it away. And so it doesn't mean there might not even be consequences. Let's say that one of us, we're guilty of some type of horrible, you know, atrocity or whatever. It might come out and we're forgiven. And later on it comes out, there still may be a consequence to pay for that. But we're forgiven before God. The difference in us, if something happens where we get exposed for what we've done in the past, is that we're forgiven. Man may not, but God has. The people now that are being exposed, if they don't know Christ, not only does man not forgive them, but God doesn't either. They get the double whammy. But for the most part, for the believer, um, I see how God protects. I've seen God protect. I remember one time, and I can share this with you. You know, It's something I was somewhere, and I was on the mission field, and this huge temptation came in on me. I didn't fall. But I started quoting scripture, and I was quoting scripture out loud. I remember I was just going back and forth going, it is written, it is written, because I, I do that. I mean, if you want to know what it's Mark doing, just hide somewhere where I'm praying. But I'm going, it is written, it is written, it is written, and I didn't sin. I fought the temptation off. God gave me victory because I ran to God in prayer and I used scripture and I battled the enemy and it wasn't because I'm anything. It was God delivered me. But what I didn't know is that somebody else was there recording me because they thought it was funny. They had a tape recorder running outside the room going, listen to Pastor Mark in there. He's saying something. Let's record it. You know how embarrassing it would have been if that recording had been recorded? They said, we recorded you. We recorded you in there. I said, really? Just kind of froze. Let me play it for you. And I'm going, oh. They played it. It was just like, couldn't hear one word couldn't hear one word there's no reason it wasn't recorded there's one reason you know why because God didn't let it be recorded you know why because he saw that my heart was being real and sincere he says you're not going to embarrass my son thanks for joining us today on come to the table with pastor Mark Kirk the Israelites journey to the promised land had reached a peak as it was recorded in the book of Joshua. They were there, but not really. They couldn't quite nail down the possession of the land. Even though this was happening, we still learn of faithful people within this time, such as Rahab, Caleb, and Joshua. What's the takeaway for us today? God keeps his promises. He's with us wherever we go, and he's faithful. Maybe today you feel like this can't possibly apply to you, but we want you to know that it absolutely does. God hasn't left you. Hang tight to that truth and search the scripture for all the promises he's given you. You can also give us a call at 865-609-1385. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Once again, that's 865-609-1385. We trust that if you don't enjoy speaking on the phone, you'll visit our website, thewaymedia.net, and search for our questions and comments link to connect with us. Don't worry, it's safe and secure and completely confidential. We'd like to invite you to come visit us. If you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love for you to come to Calvary Knoxville this Sunday. 
Feel free to refer to our website for service times, thewaymedia.net. Just scroll down and find the link to Calvary Knoxville. We're so glad you joined us today. Be sure to listen again next time for more great teaching here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.